Uh, at the outset, I am so glad to be here once again after we were here in 2017, a year before last. And this time, it's a very important occasion for us because our Vice Chancellor, Professor Talat Ahmad, is with us, who is leading the delegation, and Professor Rishi, besides being the Professor of Botany, and our colleague, is a Dean of Research at, back at our University of Kashmir. And we have been having a series of meetings with the uh, administrators and the scientists from here, uh, right from the Chancellor to the Deans and the other colleagues which has been quite fruitful and uh, it seems that the collaboration that we started is taking new directions and new dimensions in the interest of both the institutions. So that's uh, what is something very good. And uh, coming to the talk, as Robert rightly said, that this horse wheat, or the Canadian horse wheat, uh, what we call as Kunaisa Canadensis scientifically is something that became the point uh, of uh, our friendship, I would say. And uh, after that we have been adding kind of this story that we could uh, unfold with regard to this Canadian horse weed. We have been trying to see through the similar approach how that story follow, I mean, holds true for the other species as well. And that's why to the common, uh, to the horse feed, we have added this common reed, the Phragmites australis, uh, as one of the other uh, target focal species, which is a focal species in our, this Indo-US project as well. So we say that since both are the invasions and invasive species, and invasion sucks indeed. What happened? Okay. Well, uh, put my talk into the perspective, when we look at biological invasions, the, it is said that after habitat loss, biological invasions is the second largest threat to the biodiversity and the ecosystem functioning. And it entails a lot of economic damage and ecological damage as well, which has been quantified by earlier studies in dollar values, in other values as well. But a recent, uh, fairly recent study has tried to kind of look at the extent of this threat at a global scale. And if you look at this, uh, this situation globally, <coughs> it seems that hardly there is any place across the globe where this invasion is not a threat, be it in the very high, high or the low levels, but the threat is there. And uh, more so it is in the North American context, in the Indian context, Asian context, and even the European context for that matter. And in the Himalayan context especially, this is a threat, I mean, uh, pretty high. If you look at uh, this red, signifies the very high threat. So there are, <coughs> it is a problem which uh, steers us at all the places uh, and therefore needs attention. And one of the important things is that uh, although one sixth of the global land surface is highly vulnerable to invasion, but substantial areas <coughs> of this invasion happen to fall in the countries which are developing countries or the developing economies. And more, most often you will see these sites coinciding with the global biodiversity hotspots, which makes it even worse. So, uh, if you look at now, whether the countries or the regions where this invasion is a threat, they have the capacity to deal with this threat. There is a substantial variation across the globe, across, uh, between the countries, so far their capacity to deal with this threat is concerned. And uh, if you look at this proactive and the reactive approach, one is that we are proactive, we, uh, once uh, the species are, in, species are introduced, we have good mechanisms with us to predict them well in time, and once we predict them, we don't let this introduction go to a stage where it became, becomes the last stage of invasion and it is unmanageable. Or, second is the reactive approach. Once it is there, it attains the proportion of what you call as the stage five, cancerous stage of invasion where you don't have any ready-made solutions. 
So then you have no option then to react to this problem, how to manage now uh, these invaders around. In both the cases, you will see that in the proactive approach, you will find most of the developing countries, they, I'm sorry, the developed countries, the countries which have high HDI, the Human Development uh, Index, they have still these proactive policies in place, but so far the reactive approach is concerned. Most countries have limited capacity against invasions, especially the developing countries. And this uh, proactive invasion management strategy is very important, especially it is needed in the context of countries with low economic status or high poverty level. And as I said, since these, this invasion threat coincides with the biodiversity hotspots, so we have where the historical level of invasion was not that high, there has to be basically. And India somehow, if you look at Indian context, also it was not a priority in uh, recent past even. And if you look at the countries that are signatories to CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, almost only half of the countries have put in place the action plan as is envisaged by the AC targets uh, so far the management of invasion or the invasive species is concerned. Now, this is the most recent uh, kind of update in the Indian context. Uh, our lab has already documented the, as you saw in the documentary uh, film yesterday as well, the invasion, I mean the status of invasive species in the Himalayan context, Kashmir Himalaya, uh, both in the aquatic and the terrestrial systems. And this study has recently kind of uh, mapped the distribution of the naturalized species in Indian context. And it seems that there is, you know, uh, the number of naturalized species spread across the country is pretty high, although uh, they have only taken into consideration the naturalized species. If you take the invasive species in particular, probably the situation would be even uh, worse. Now, uh, somebody recently has tried to look at invasion in the context of the disasters. And they say that uh, invasions are like natural disasters. You have some basic characteristic features of disasters. Say disasters are difficult to control, hard to predict, you know, and they are catastrophic in their nature. And these were some of the, these are some of the important, if you look at floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, droughts, these are the, what you call as natural disasters. Somebody, and this was a paper published way back in 1986. Somebody has recently added to this the invasion as well and try to see, say for example, if you took, take into account the predictability aspect. Invasions are pretty hard to predict. So uh, if you rank them in the descending order of magnitude here, droughts you can predict better than floods, than hurricanes, and invasions are pretty hard to predict, right? Although there are different risk assessment schemes now in place, different predictive models uh, are being developed. We have also developed, for example, very simple predictive models based on the native range size with, uh, with this perspective that if a species is, if a species is uh, wider in its native range, it is so because of certain characteristic features. And with those characteristic features, if it goes to the non-native range, those attributes predispose it to be invasive, right? So uh, likewise, this in the human lethality context or the scope of area affected, somehow the fact of the matter is that invasion figures quite well in the attributes that characterize disasters. So that means there is an argument that yes, it is something uh, like a disastrous situation and demands the response accordingly. And these are the things which substantiate this argument. If you look at the number of invasions and the extinction events, or for that matter, very important uh, here, say, although our scientific understanding of invasions is quite good, but the feasibility of control is not uh, so good as it is in case of this, say, for example, genetically modified organisms. So the point basically that I want to make here is that there is a significant support to the argument that it is a situation 
something similar to the disaster. And we have some of such disasters in our context as well. As you saw in the movie as uh, well yesterday, if you were there, uh, this is the latest case of invasion by a species of Nymphia, Nymphia mexicana, uh, the lily pad invasion, what we commonly call as there in our Dal Lake. And we have similar situations in most of the water bodies across the Kashmir Himalayan Valley. Uh, and this uh, disastrous situation merits a response accordingly. If you look at this picture, this is kind of the, the Lakes and Development Authority, who is the government agency to manage and regulate these lakes. They employed last year 500 uh, laborers on per day basis with a remuneration of 500 rupees per day. And their day would be of say four hours of work only because you cannot work more than that. Here to clear this patch. The idea was, I mean, if they do it mechanically, it detops it and because of the overcompensatory growth, it grows again. So let's try to kind of do it manually. That was the idea. And once they did it, they, in the whole six months of uh, uh, the, the functioning sort of period, they could clear a very small patch of it. And this year, once we looked at those patches, this had a regrowth, considerable significant regrowth at those places. Because if you, if you leave even a small fragment there, because of the regenerative capacity or the vegetative growth, it comes up, right? So my point is that look at the economic cost that it entails. Look at, I mean, regardless of the ecological fallouts, once it completely covers the lake, look at the situation that it has for the native biodiversity or the below water level sort of uh, floral and faunal uh, diversity. So this is the situation there and you have similar situations in the other world bodies. Now, a very interesting point that basically I want to uh, bring to your attention is that regardless of the fact that this is a problem globally accepted and there is a huge body of literature that supports this argument, there is simultaneously a, uh, a counter sort of an argument that invasion is not a problem at all. The way you have it for the climate change, for instance, you have the opposite group saying that climate change is absolutely no issue. And you know the scientific evidence, which is basically uh, substantiating that. So in that context, if you look at the studies that have been published over these years that deny that invasion is a problem, it has been significantly going up. These are articles in the scientific journals and even other important say, say, say outlets. So it is, it is rising. Now the, they, what the argument they have? The arguments basically these people have who deny this invasion as a problem is that probably we as scientists are not able to define invasive species in unamb unambiguous terms. And uh, that's one reason or for that matter this species introduction and reintroduction has been there from very historical times as well, so on and so forth. And to some extent, I mean, uh, this gets you as an invasion biologist into trouble that if your basic uh, kind of framework is being questioned, what do you do, right? So in that context, what we did was, uh, there was a question that we simply asked with these uh, is, uh, Uma Shankar, Arvind, and uh, Ravika from the southern part of India, eight region organization. In a discussion, we asked a very, uh, we, uh, we, we thought a simple uh, point. Is there a possible way to alternatively define or look at invasive species in purely ecological perspective, say ecological niche perspective? Because we, what we thought was, say for example, if a species comes from a native range to a non-native range, and in the non-native range it occupies similar sort of a niche as it occupies in the native range, then is it the case of species just realizing its potential niche, or 
if there is a possibility that in the non-native regions, the species after getting introduced gets out of those native niche boundaries. And that is what would be basically more disastrous. And that would be a problem, right? And this was a kind of argument that we uh, made as a small one page, one and a half page article that time. And this, in fact, did set us thinking about it. And we thought, let's test it with some species. And we selected some 12, 13 odd species to test this uh, question, whether species that are globally known as invaders, uh, worst invaders, whether they go in the non-native range out of those native niche boundaries or they stay within or their niche overlaps the native niche. Uh, look at this. I will give you an example here of only two species. One, of course, the Coryza canadensis and another this uh, impatience blandulifera, which we commonly call as Himalayan balsam, native of Himalayan region, but very invasive in many parts of the Europe and in some parts of North America as well. And what we did was we took into account the, uh, it is the native of this place and it has invaded, sorry, it has invaded, as I said, Europe and many parts of this uh, American continent as well. And we took the native distribution records and the distribution records of this species from GBIF and the other sources uh, in the non-native regions as well. And through the, ec the ecological uh, niche modeling approach, we tried to see what happens to the native distribution, uh, what, what happens to the distribution pattern of this species in the native and the non-native regions. If you look at this PCA, you will see that in case of impatience glandulifera, this is the native niche and this is the niche in its non-native region. So that means this species has a tendency to go out of the native niche boundaries in the non-native places. That's why we perceive it should be a more problematic situation than a species if it stays within its native niche boundaries. But if you look at this Coneza canadensis, its native niche boundaries almost overlap its non-native. That means in the non-native places, it stays within those temperature, moisture, other characteristics which uh, characterize the niche in those sort of major things where it is in its native place. So technically speaking, it should not be, therefore, a major issue of invasion, right? But you see here, if you look at I mean, there's almost a complete overlap. Very, very small, you know, uh, take out there. Now, the point that I want to basically make here is simple. It's a situation like this. If a camel goes from a desert in India to a desert in Africa, should we call it as invasions? Probably not, because desert is a home for camel, it will always go to a desert. But if a, des if a camel goes to a forest like this, so that would be a problem, right? So that was the perspective that actually uh, was driving our fundamental question, whether a species in its non-native range goes out of its uh, you know, native niche boundaries. And now the point basically that I want to now make with Kuneza is, regardless of the fact that it does not go out of the native niche boundaries in the non-native place, but the impact it makes in the non-native regions is entirely different than it has in its native region, which is a very important uh, you know, thing that I actually want to emphasize. I mean, uh, we also focused, as I said, on Phragmites australis. I will try to tell you how these two species, the common reed and the horse weed, uh, have the different sort of impacts in the native and non-native regions, regardless of the fact that uh, in terms of native distribution. In my last talk where, that I delivered here, I <coughs> did talk about this uh, pattern of you know, impact of uh, 
recognize the Canadenses in the native and non-native regions. If you can recall that all these red ones are the non-native places across uh, Europe, China, Kashmir, and so on. And these are all non-native, sorry, the native uh, sites in the US and the Canada and so on. And if you look at, this is the basically relationship between the Coniza abundance versus the native species richness. And you have steep negative relationships all across the non-native regions. But we do not have such sort of relationships in any of the native sites. And in one of the sites, we even could see more facilitative role of you know, uh, this species with regard to the other species. And once having discovered this sort of a pattern with Coriza, we in this project wanted to see if it is so with Phragmites as well. And we have been sampling Phragmites for last couple of years across ranges in Europe and North America and Asia and other places. Uh, Robert has been leading this effort in this part. And of course, one of his PhD students, uh, David, has helped us doing it in Europe. And Christoph, also probably whom you might have heard it. We, uh, he had also delivered a talk, I think, last year here. So, uh, and these are the sampling sites across Kashmir and North America, we have sampled it. And I was just trying to, for this talk, to, to look at the results. Although we do not have sufficient number of native sites yet with us, but it looks like that from the sites that we have done so far, in non-native regions, this species also somehow uh, register almost a similar impact as Coriza does with respect to the native species uh, diversity. So the, uh, we are trying to sort of add more sites in this field season to this, and probably by the end of uh, hopefully this season we'll be pretty sure about the trends that are coming up. But the initial results are that yes, it is doing something similar. As we had done in case of the Coriza canadensis, after we looked at the global patterns of its impact, we try to see uh, if we grow this Coniza canadensis with this uh, species that co-occur with it in the native regions and in the non-native regions, what sort of competitive effects or the competitive responses it has. And what we found was in our Coniza case that uh, this species was strongly inhibited by the species from the North America, but not by the species from Kashmir or China or Hungary, for that matter, or, or Europe. But in, in, in turn, the Coriza had a very strong impact on those species, uh, on the species which are native to, uh, say, its non-native places, but not to the species which are native to uh, Europe, uh, sorry, uh, to North America. And in case of Phragmites, Phragmites is a European native for that matter. And we just were looking at this some sort of the results. If you look at the impact, this is, uh, this is the control where this Phragmites from North America was grown alone. And this is the these are the Phragmites which were, uh, were grown with the competitors from Europe. One, two, three, four, five. These are five uh, competitors, competitor species from Europe. And it seems that average number of leaves, dry weight, or the biomass, and the height are all the uh, traits which are significantly being influenced by, by the competition of this species. And uh, so, and if you look at the effect of North American competitors, the effect is not so significant as you find in, in, in this case. So that means uh, these competitive effects and the responses of Phragmites give us a sense that it also has significantly different impacts in the native and the non-native regions, right? And uh, that means, even if a species is within the native niche boundaries, it can have very different impacts across. And with Coriza, very recently, this, uh, is, uh, this was kind of published in this uh, ecological monographs, the kind of study that I did mention probably in my last talk as well, and that was concluded here. After we look at, looked at the global patterns of invasion of Coriza, as I showed you there, and it was pretty clear that it has different impacts in the native and non-native regions. It added to our curiosity, does it vary in terms of genetic diversity in native 
and non-native regions. And is that genetic diversity variation something uh, that contributes to its invasiveness across ranges? And what we did was, uh, I mean, look, look at this. If you look at these are the you know, results of that genetic clustering patterns, uh, we could, two interesting things. One, that we would expect that there are very significant variations between the ranges, between the native and the non-native regions, which was not the case. We did find variations, of course, between the native and non-native regions, but there were more significant variations between populations in the non-native regions. I mean, between population variations in the non-native regions were quite significant. Uh, so which is the point, basically, that you know, helps it uh, becoming more invasive or uh, flexible to occupy different sort of, sorts of situations and uh, be successful uh, under so all those sorts of situations. And uh, this uh, PCA significantly demonstrates the distribution. If you look, uh, more so than this, if you look at the geographical distance versus the genetic distance in the native and the non-native regions, also, the climatic distance versus the genetic distance, you will see that this genetic distance is significantly being influenced by the geographical distance in the non-native context, more so in the native context. And here also in the climatic, if you look at climatic distance as a function of genetic distance in invaded regions or the invaded ranges, it has more so, I mean, a pretty significant sort of a relationship than you have in the non-native regions. And in case of Phragmites also, what we have done so far is that we compared its morphology in native and non-native regions and the genetic part of it. We did not have, unfortunately, that time the samples from Europe were from its native. We only had samples from North America and the Kashmir Himalayan region. In North America region, but we have both the native and the exotic haplotypes of this species. And what we found was, because it was reported earlier that probably this phragmatis is native of uh, North America. And once we thought about it, we eventually realized that it is not basically native of North America, it is basically native of Europe. Because if, you, if we compare uh, the, uh, you know, the allele frequency, I mean, 86.2% of alleles are common in the or uh, here, or alleles common with the Kashmir exotics, the Europe, uh, the, the the North American exotics and the Kashmir exotics have pretty high degree of allele similarity, which means that somebody called as Salton Stahl has already done it in case of Phragmites with Europe, and he has found that the the uh, invader which is in North America, it is basically native of Europe. So since if the genetic uh, makeup of species in uh, Canada matches uh, Canada and uh, North America here, I mean, in, in the, this part of the US, matches with the genetic makeup with our species. And it has been already established that the species which is problematic in uh, North America is native of Europe. It tells us that our species is also native of Europe, which is kind of more uh, acceptable also given the two facts. One, that Europe is quite geographically closer to the Kashmir Himalayan region, one. And second, that there was a colonial past because of which there was a trade and transport and traffic uh, relations between the, between the regions as well. And uh, these native and exotic haplotypes of Phragmites did uh, kind of go altogether different. These are three different clusters, only few native haplotypes. These are the Kashmir exotics. These are the uh, North, America, North American uh, exotics. So the point basically that I want to make here is that we have the evidence from Phragmites as well that in terms of genetic patterns it varies in the na native and non-native regions. And what we are trying to look at now is whether there are other, uh, the way we did it with Coniza, we are trying to see if we have already got leaf samples and we are probably going to sample more you know, uh, populations in this growing season and do the exhaustive genetic analysis to see if these genetic patterns also 
uh, match the patterns that we have got in case of the uh, Kunaiza keratensis. And uh, what I basically try to uh, connect the dots, say for instance in case of the Kunaiza keratensis. We found that yes, it has different impacts in the native and non-native regions. We found that there is some genetic basis to that as well. And then we were wondering whether there are some ecological or the ecophysiological basis to this as well. A very simple thing that we did was <coughs> that there are three species of Coniza that we have. Since these are phylogenetically related, Coniza sumatriensis, Canadensis, and the Bonariensis. And the Sumatriensis, I must tell you, is also a very highly invasive species in our case. Even more invasive than Canadensis in our part of uh, this, uh, uh, the world. And our earlier one of the studies had shown that there is a phylogenetic basis of this. We had asked a simple question. I mean, what makes this species invasive? Is it that once, for example, Coriza invades from North America to the Himalayan region? One of the strategies for this species to be successful is to associate with those species with whom it does not enter into a competition. That is a strategy to avoid competition, isn't it? So that means it would tend to get associated with phylogenetically distant species than phylogenetically related species. And we exactly found that in native regions, you will find it more associated with the phylogenetically close species, but in the non-native regions, it uh, gets associated with phylogenetically distant species. That w having that background in mind, we thought, since these are phylogenetically related, do they have some ecophysiological basis? Because we thought being invasive means that it must be uh, more efficient in terms of photosynthesis. It must be making better use of resources. Its water use efficiency should be higher, so on and so forth, that contribute to its invasiveness. And this is what we found. If you look at this net photosynthesis uh, scenario as a function of uh, photosynthetically active radiations, we found that this Coriza sumatriensis flattens or, you know, at a pretty high, uh, sorry, pretty low level of this. More importantly, something that substantiates is this. If you see this photosynthetic efficiency as a function of internal carbon dioxide concentration or the CO2 concentration, you will find that this can, here it is in the blue, there it was in the green. So here it basically flattens at a pretty high, you know, uh, degree of simply signifying that if there is a carbon dioxide con uh, CO2 concentration increase in the context of climate change, the sumatrances would be far more successful than the other species. So that means there is, and Uzma did, for instance, this experiment, and where she tried to see if mycorrhiza also help in that uh, or not. And she found that, yes, once you inoculate this coriza sweatrances with mycorrhiza, and its photosynthetic rate is significantly, uh, far more significantly improved as compared to uh, the, the, the effect on the, say, coriza canadensis and the uh, bonariensis. So, uh, and here, if you look at the transpiration rate, Sumatriensis transpiration rate is far lower than the other two species, and the water use efficiency is pretty high. That means these are some of the traits that help the species to be kind of, you know, invasive. That means there is an ecophysiological basis besides the genetic basis or the phylogenetic basis to its invasion as well. And there is a pretty uh, good support to this argument from the literature that yes, the water use efficiency of the native and invasive plants significantly varies. And invasive species are doing far better than the native species. If you see these are the species pairs for the invasive species as compared to the native species from the literature, it seems that invasive species have a better basically mechanism of using the resources than the native species or than the non-invasive species to, to further their invasion. And <coughs> we did find uh, that we compared nat sorry the invasive alien versus invasive non uh, I mean 
alien invasive versus alien non-invasive species in our case. Just we thought, how do they vary? I mean, a subset of, say, 70 alien species which are invasive versus 70 alien species which are not invasive. And if you look at the results in terms of propagule length, propagule breadth, because it was a study that was more focused on the, uh, you know, dispersal syndromes, propagule weight or dispersal duration, propagules per plant. In all the cases, invasive species seem to be far, I mean, doing far better than the non-invasive alien species. That means there is something different in these invasive species, which is not in those species which do not become invasive. And we also found that there is the role of ploidy. I mean, no, it has been reported by other workers as well that once these species go from native to non-native regions, usually their ploidy levels also change. For example, in case of the Centaurus stevi, in uh, it has been found that in Europe it is diploid, but in, uh, in North America and other invaded regions it is tetraploid. So we found in case of the Kashmir Himalayan context, so for the uh, alien flora that we have, aquatic alien flora, with the, that we tested it. And we found that, yes, as we progress with the stage of invasion, you have more polyploids at the higher stages of invasion. That means that also adds uh, one more dimension to their invasiveness. So having said this, uh, we believe that Himalayan region in general is a window to a lot of possibilities. We can ask n number of great questions with regard to the invasive species in the Himalayan region. And for that matter, University of Kashmir and Montana Technological University or Montana Tech, previously what you call, used to call as, are now well positioned to be part of that really exciting discourse to at least explore some of those possibilities. And the kind of discourse that we have had for the last two days now somehow gives me the confidence and the hope that we will be kind of supported at both the places to ask these questions jointly together. And there's already a memorandum of understanding between the institutions for doing that, which has been revised recently, and hopefully we have added new things to that. Uh, and this has been pretty successful uh, collaboration so far. Just a glimpse, a few glimpses of the exchanges that we have had uh, our last year here, and then the people from this place when they visited us uh, the last year. Many talks were delivered by them, those people there, as we are delivering here. So this is a completely reciprocal sort of a discourse. And with that, I thank you all, and I acknowledge all uh, these good students. Roshan, whom you know, who was here last year. Mother Siddhar has been working in this project. Both of them are now also in a job as assistant professors. Gawahar works on Phragmites. Uzma is here. So, and all these funding agencies for their support. And thank you very much uh, for this uh, patient listening.